Hey y'all, um, my name is Erica and I'm going to be introducing two readings to you. Um, the first one's going to be the Foucault Femininity and the Modernization of Patriarchal Power. This was written by Sandra Bartke. It was written in 1990, I believe. Um, let me double check. Yeah, 1990. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because uh, this batch of reading in particular um, reminded me of an important lesson, and that is that having context, um, I mean, at the beginning of each reading, stopping to look at the context of what's being written is important. And what was helpful for me um, was to remember that in that political climate, in that era, how much courage it actually took to write such a piece and um, having that sort of awareness really helps when I found myself getting triggered um, and then, you know, around certain word choices. And then additionally, um, I recognized pretty early on um, the, that this one, okay, so this, this reading in particular is uh, Second Wave Feminism. And so it reminded me of the importance of having patience around language because the, you know, certain, the way we use words now isn't the way that it, they were used earlier. And, I forget that sometime, and especially um, this is my first semester here, so learning how to critique is, you know, a muscle I'm still getting used to using, and so I feel like I can um, get a little too overly critiquish, and I lose, you know, the heart of the work. So I just wanted to share that with y'all because that was an important part of something I learned this time around. Um, so to jump into it, um, let's see. All right, so this piece is a critique on um, Foucault's article that was writing about docile bodies. So um, he begins by talking about, uh, okay, so docile bodies is a result of a policy of coercions that act upon the body by societal structures such as the military, school system, criminal justice system, healthcare, etc. And um, the systems, uh, race, class, gender, systems of oppression, um, he didn't use that word, I'm throwing that in there, uh, code us with the rules of how we are to act, how we are to um, move through the society. So um, one thing that he was saying is that um, when we were born, based upon our access to resources, based upon the identity, right, like political identity politics, um, society imprints us with a, as like a cog. Society tells us, Specifically, what is expected of us, how we are to how we are to act, how we are to move around in the world. So he uses the example of um, the training of a soldier and the training of a monk to show the two separate approaches to controlling the body and the mind, as well as to sh uh, to introduce the dimensions of time and space um, into the uh, mechanisms of control. So time, um, just like a, kind of to run through real quick. Um, Time is something that is very politically oriented. Um, just use an example about my grandfather. My grandfather was, um, he started working at Ford, the, the auto industry, you know, the automobile industry, um, when he was 18. And so he started working in the blast furnace. And from the first few years, even though he, you know, had a family young, um, he was always working because they were not allowed a lot of time off. There weren't, they weren't given um, options on when to take their lunch or their breaks. Everything was predetermined. And then as he um, you know, got older and moved up in his work, he was, able, he was given more freedom to choose how to approach his tasks. He was given more freedom to choose when to take his time off. And so if we look at, you know, I know this is a pretty, you know, um, pretty common example, but if we look at who has access to jobs that have more flexibility with their time? It's folks with resources, right? Um, so that's how one example of how time is political. And then when he uses the term space, he's talking about not just um, physical space, because later, a little bit later on, the author, um, sorry, what's her name? Bartke will go into examples of how female um, identify, how the female identity codes us into taking up smaller space, right? Like like physically taking up a lot um, less space with like, you know, um, we're supposed to be small and, and quaint. And, and then, you know, she talks about body movements, you know, like 
our arms crossed or our legs crossed. Um, so there's the actual like physical thing of space, but then there's the, I guess, uh, the space that's taken up with our presence, right? Um, space is taken up when with our ability to project our voice. Uh, if we if we t if we think about the you know when we're in a room full of people, um, how certain folks take up more space, right? Like their questions are more abundant. Um, they speak louder. They demand attention. Um, that's another aspect of space, and that's also what he was talking about. So, uh, oh, I actually forgot to tell you how I'm structuring this. So I'm going to be going over some notes of the readings, and then you'll notice at the bottom that I'm going to have some questions for you all, for you, for you guys. Um, so, you know, please feel free to answer all the questions or some of the questions, or if anything that I'm discussing um, pops up a question or a story within yourself, then please share that instead. Um, okay, so the next, I guess, piece I want to go over um, in explaining the barrage of ways that a woman must control or manage her body, Bartke states that a woman's body is an ornamented surface too. She introduces the concept of adornment and jumps into the various manifestations of the cosmetic industry, lotions, dyes, makeup, etc., and the ritualistic way in which women are taught to maintain the appearance of face and body. So um, I do have some, some questions for you down there, but I just want to share um, experience that I had um, that brought me to this. So I study Ayurveda. It's an Indian science. It's an, well, an ancient Indian science. It was it was written in the Vedas, which is the oldest known spiritual written spiritual text to man. Um, and in so Ayurveda means the science of life, and in that you talk about how to live as a whole being, healthy and happy as a, a being with a mind, body, and soul. And one of the aspects that we're taught is um, that adorning one's body and, and beauty ritual is sacred work. Um, but the context from which that comes from is looking at all of the things that we adorn our bodies with and all the, I guess, the cosmetics that we're using on our body is viewing it as medicine, right? So the stones that we're adorning our body with, the, um, the flowers that we're putting in our hair, like straight up, this what they talk about. The flowers that we put in our hair, the oil that we put on our skin, the kajal that we surround our eyes, they all have medicinal properties. So when the author talked about the view um, that a woman's body is an ornament and surface and that, and then she goes on to state that um, in order for us to basically say a big F you to the patriarchal system that tells us that we need to adorn our body because it's lesser than, um, and so the only way to, to fight that is to refrain from all of it. Um, it felt very empty. It felt like a very um, non-spiritual, non-ethnic, non-community-based way of thinking. Um, I'm not going to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into too much. But within my own family, um, I'm, I'm Mexican. I grew up with my mom. Within my own family, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of beauty practices that are passed down to us and yeah it's you know wrapped up within capitalism and consumerism because it's all you know like dove and oil volet and you know those type of things are talked about but really what i notice is that in a culture in our culture where women were expected were demanded of so much that the beauty ritual was one of the few ways that we were encouraged to take time for ourselves so even though now the way that my mom raised us is different than she was raised um, beauty is the one realm that really gets my mom, allows my mom to get in touch with women's space. Um, when she, she doesn't really hang out with, with many women, let alone to have a space dominated by women. So really when she goes to get her hair done, it's like a sacred, it's a sacred space. It's a sacred ritual. So, um, I felt like those pieces were missing when the author offered this critique. Um, but, um, Please let me know what you all think. All right, so the next thing is um, Bartke gives a fancy analogy where she explains how femininity is a performance of coded behavior that is inherently oppressive because virtually every woman is required to perform and the nature of the criteria, sorry, the nature of the criteria, criteria by which women are judged reflects the gross imbalance of social power between the sexes. She believes that the technic technology is a femininity 
are practiced because of an inherent belief that the female body is flawed, not good enough. The narrow identification of women of woman with sexuality and the body in a society that has for centuries displayed profound suspicion toward both does little to raise her status. Therefore, even if a woman is able to successfully practice the discipline of jumping through all the hoops, ne hoops necessary to be the perfect female, she still doesn't obtain real power. So that's kind of a mouthful, um, and I, I wrote that down for you all too. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how do how does this pertain in your life? Um, for me, the first thing that came up is is how my female bodiness plays a role in the workplace, um, and specifically how different it is working with um, ma all male or mostly male based folk versus working with all female coworkers. Um, even actually in my um, Two jobs ago, I worked with the all-female staff, and actually most of them were queer. And even in that situation where it was known, common knowledge that women were attracted to women, sexuality was like total, it was a total different place for it. Total different place. And that was the first time in my entire, I was actually talking about this last night, it was the first time in my entire life where my, my sexuality, my that was, you know, my sex, the presentation of my sexuality didn't play a role in my success at work. It didn't play a role in my connection with my coworkers. Um, and I didn't realize how often that came up for me until I was in this space. Um, so I encourage you to um, think about that. And then also think about when the author uses the term woman or women, who is she talking about? I think it's pretty obvious, but I wanted to ask you there. Um, and, uh, and then also in terms of gender as a performance, um, I felt that this concept also was from a very like Western way of thinking, very non-spiritually based. Um, so the Vedas are, you know, Ayurveda and the Vedas talk about that we are a reflection, right? The micro is a reflection of the macro. So we are a reflection of that which exists outside of the universe. Therefore, you know, they identify... Um, plants and animals and gods and goddesses are different reflections of, of masculine and feminine energy. I mean, yeah, there's a binary in that it's called the masculine and it's called the feminine, but the manifestation of each, there's so many varying, you know, like, like just in the, within the um, sacred feminine alone, I think we talked about this actually the first, um, our first weekend together, um, just within the sacred feminine alone, you know, we have Kali, who's who's destroyer, right? She's literally tearing apart bodies, and that's her role. While another manifestation of a divine feminine is a nurturing, mothering, you know, caretaking, and um, but that diversity is reflected. So, to say that gender is a performance and that it, it makes it sound like it's just totally fake. And again, I understand what the doc, what, what the doctor, what the author was was trying to say um, in terms of the coding aspect of it, but I just really wish that there was more room for, um, I guess, more spiritual perspective. Um, let's see. The next piece is, um, the last piece I'm going to talk about with this article. Bartke states, femininity as a certain style of flesh will have to be surpassed in the direction of something quite different not masculinity, which is in many ways only its mirror opposite, but a radical and as yet unimagined transformation of the female body. So I kind of spoke a little bit about it, about this in the last piece. Um, my first question is, what, what do we imagine? What do we imagine will need to change in order for femininity to not be such a strongly coded cog? in our society. And first thought for me was um, to show different manifest, you know, to have it be more common for different manifestations of femininity to be in the public eye. And then another thing as well um, would be for more uh, inclusion of gender as a spectrum, right, rather than a binary. But, um, but I know there's a lot of y'all who've been on the front lines doing um, work around yeah, gender work and, and anti-bullying and um, homophobia and I mean they're all closely related so if you I'm really interested in hearing 
your experience on this. So I will click back. Uh, I will end this and I'll see you all in the next piece.